Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Founder Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Wu. In this podcast series, I interview exceptional individuals from all over the world with the Founder Spirit, ranging from social entrepreneurs, tech founders, to philanthropists, elite athletes, and more. Together, we'll uncover not only how they manage to succeed in face of multiple challenges, but also who they are as people and their human story. Our guest today is Amit Munshi, a serial entrepreneur and a turnaround expert with over 30 years in the biopharmaceutical industry. Until recently, Amit was the president and CEO of Arena Pharmaceuticals, where he successfully transformed the company from $300 million in market cap to finally being acquired by Pfizer for $6.7 billion over a period of six years. Amit also led turnarounds of two other companies, Iparis and Persivia, and co-founded Kythera Biopharmaceuticals before it was sold to Elegan for $2.1 billion in 2015. He honed his commercial skills at Johnson & Johnson, Astra Merck, and Emgen, where he was responsible for its $16 billion acquisition of Immunex and its European Nephrology Business Unit based in Switzerland. Ame is currently the chairman of the board at Enterprise Therapeutics in the UK and a board member at Galecto in Denmark and Oxia Biopharmaceuticals in the US, a company that he also co-founded. He holds a dual bachelor's degree in history and economics from the University of California at Riverside, as well as an MBA from Claremont Graduate University. Hi, Emma. Thank you and welcome to the Founder Spirit Podcast. We're very excited to have you with us today, and thank you for taking the time. Jennifer, thanks for having me. Amit, we're going to start today's podcast with a question from my son. He wants to know what you were like growing up. I was a very serious kid. I had both the combined opportunity and what you perceive as a child of misfortune of traveling all over the world with my parents. I grew up in Hong Kong, Japan. I was born in London, spent time in India before moving to the U.S. As the oldest son in the family and a lot of moving around, I was a very serious kid. I spent a lot of time reading. Between my brother and I, we didn't have a lot of friends as we were moving around, so it was just the two of us finding ways to entertain each other and waiting for the next, next transfer order to the next location. We spent a lot of time, again, just the two of us, and as a result, we became very close. And importantly, that whole growing up experience teaches you to adapt and change. But as a child, you don't really understand that. It's kind of a difficult process. But I found myself as a very serious child. Prior to starting your professional life in biotech, your first job was actually at McDonald's. And I always tell my kids that they should work at least once in food services, especially at McDonald's, because if they work there, they'll never want to eat there for the rest of their lives. <laughs> But you also had more interesting jobs, which mark the beginning of your sales career. So can you tell us what these jobs were and how some of the skills that you developed back in the day stayed with you throughout your career? Yeah, it's interesting. You, um, beyond never wanting to eat a filet of fish in my entire life, teaches you to work with lots of different people, broad sort of swaths of the population. You get Later in your professional life, you're in biotech, especially you're surrounded by brilliant individuals with MDs and PhDs and who went to top universities. But I think it's really important to understand that how to navigate and how to communicate with just a broad range of people. And I think that's one of the most important things I tell our kids is just to have that range. You, know, you should feel comfortable in any environment, not just a certain pocket of people, for example. So I think that's one kind of key learning. I took these jobs not out of learning, but out of necessity, as most of us did early in our lives. But I, I reflect back and I think about, A, that the ability to, again, work with lots of different kinds of people, and two, the ability to sell. It's something that I think is, sales has got kind of a bad rap, I think, overall in terms of an actual skill. As a CEO of a public biotech company, you're selling your story. You're selling your corporate story. You're selling your team. You're selling your the ability of your assets to make a difference for patients. So you're that sales skill just never goes away. And I, I had a chance to sell vending machines. I had a chance to sell radiators. I had a chance to sell all kinds of really interesting things And over the years. And these were all commission-only jobs. I really think that beyond 
spending some time in food service, it's really important to think about something in the sales area. I think it's a kind of a key defining character building endeavor. You mentioned something about the commission only jobs. Why do you think it's so important to have a job that's commission only? Again, I, I didn't take these as learning experiences. I took them out of necessity. Those, When you're a high school student or a young college student, those are the jobs that are open and available to you. And I never kind of shied away from it. it begins, you begin to trust yourself that you can make something happen, something out of nothing, right? From the unmanifest to the manifest, that is a really interesting skill because it begins to build your own personal confidence and alleviate fear, right? We have the fear of the unknown, the fear of where do you get your next paycheck? How do you make your rent? I'm hoping most of your listeners have gone through some journeys in their life where they've had those kinds of fears. And, and I think early on, building those, those sales skills was critical. I look back of all the things I've ever done, including my MBA and including all the, the seminal learnings at Amgen and J&J and Astra Merck and all of that. I think the single most defining jobs I ever had were commission-only sales jobs. You know, interesting because it's also about fear. It's also about overcoming the fear of rejection because when you're selling, I guess, vending machines or light bulbs or radiators door to door, you're going to get rejected most of the time, right? It builds your resilience to rejection later on in life, especially when you're fundraising. Absolutely. And again, back to working with lots of different kinds of people, right? If you're selling vending machines, you're moving from small shop to small shop and you're dealing with small shopkeepers, tire shops. Anywhere where someone's waiting for a service, optometrist office, you're kind of dealing with a broad swath of people. So light bulbs for a couple of years and dealt with a lot of rental houses in Hollywood. There's just a really interesting broad range of people that you deal with, different personality types, different educational backgrounds. That ability to communicate, again, is really, really critical when you're thinking about building your life, your career. Is there a funny story that you have from those days that you'd recall? Well, I'll never forget the first week I was out selling light bulbs. I had an old Volkswagen Jetta, loaded up the bulbs in the back. The car had 80,000 miles on it or 100,000 miles on it. I was in Southern California at the time. I drove to Hollywood and my father was a banker, a commercial banker. And so, you know, we were trained to put on a suit and tie when kind of in the work environment. So I put on my suit and tie walk into these rental houses and everybody was in shorts and flip-flops with ponytails. And hey, I was absolutely a fish out of water. And I came in very formal with my business card, you know, while the customer had- Selling light bulbs. Yeah, selling light bulbs while the customer had his feet up on the desk with no shoes on. It's coming back to kind of understanding the environment you're in and adapting. And by the second week, I was in jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers. You take from your last experience you build, and say governments always fight the last war. Like even in jobs, you take the lessons you learned from the last time you try to apply them, and then you realize maybe you need to adapt, maybe you need to change. Amit, um, you majored in history and economics. I'm assuming that you didn't take that many biology or chemistry classes at university and weren't necessarily planning to have a career in the healthcare industry. So what eventually led you to join this industry? Well, interestingly, science was my first love. Loved it through high school. I went to uh, UC Riverside in the pre-med program and then ran into the uh, buzz saw that is organic chemistry, decided that uh, Thursday afternoon happy hours were more fun than Thursday afternoon labs, decided to make a change, much to my parents' dismay. But I always loved the sciences. I loved the sciences through high school. I was a very enthusiastic student in the sciences, and that kind of continued all the way through. You know, I tell my kids all the time that to use a basketball analogy, to dribble with their heads up, meaning you don't know where your life's going to take you. You don't know if you're going to have to jog left or jog right, if the pass is coming to you or you're making the pass. And I apologize for the basketball analogy, but that's the world I grew up in. What's interesting is it was my first year in business school. I was still selling light bulbs. Ended up in a conversation with someone who worked at J&J &J in ophthalmology. And we started talking about different intraocular lens designs. And of course, intraocular lens in an eye is just a inverse of a, a motion picture light. And so we started talking about focal length and refraction and diffraction. And the next thing you know, I got offered a job at J&J. &J. Again, you never know when one thing leads to the next and new doors open up. I think it's one of the interesting things that's happened throughout my entire career in life is 
interesting things happen at interesting times if you're aware. You had mentioned that the four years that you spent at Johnson & Johnson was foundational. Can you tell us in what way was it foundational for you? Yeah, the company was going through some very difficult times. I worked at a group called IOLAB Corporation. The first thing that I think it was really foundational was coming out of the selling light bulbs and selling vending machines. All of a sudden, you found yourself in a really professional environment with knowledgeable, brilliant people, all trying to improve the human condition. And it was such an eye-opener for me to kind of sit back and go, wow, this is very different. This is a group of people who care deeply about what they're doing. They're, of course, they're highly educated. A lot of them were trained as scientists. And it was really kind of an eye-opener from that perspective. But it was really foundational for two reasons. One, the company was not doing well. And there were some changes in reimbursement for intraocular lenses. And intraocular lenses, for all your listeners, are the lenses that are put in the eye post-cataract surgery. So if you've had a loved one that's gone through a cataract surgery and had a lens replaced in the eye, that's an intraocular lens. In the U.S., the reimbursement had changed for an intraocular lens from the federal government. The business was in trouble. As a consequence, a lot of people were leaving. They were going to different J&J companies or going to other medical technology companies. And as a young person, I decided to stick it out. As I stayed there longer, more and more opportunities came available to me. So I got a chance to work on business development. I got a chance to work on a product launch. I got a chance to work on in licensing of technologies. I got to work on M&A, mergers and acquisitions all in a very short amount of time. I mean, it was an incredible experience. I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor there by the name of Dan McWard. Dan recently passed away. And another gentleman by the name of Bob Tony. they were instrumental in just giving me opportunities, partly because there were not a lot of people left, partly because I was always willing to raise my hand and jump into the fray. It was an amazing time and was surrounded by amazing people. It really kind of opened my eyes to what's possible in the life sciences. That's interesting because in 1994, you joined Merck, which was a joint venture between a Swedish pharma, Astra, and Merck, a U.S. company. And it's also a company that's quite entrepreneurial and forward-thinking at the time. And I think you were part of the first wave people that initially joined, about 100 or 200 or so employees. And the timing of Merck coincided with the beginning of the boom in managed care in the U.S., which is, for the people that don't know, is the type of healthcare like the HMOs focused on reducing costs while keeping the high quality of care in the U.S. And the company, Astra Merck, didn't actually engage in any R&D, and it was essentially a distribution organization that had pioneered a new approach to market prescription drugs. And I think there was even a Harvard Business School case study written about it. Can you tell us about what this new marketing approach was and how you guys managed to create the market access for Prelosic, which is this ulcer drug from Astra? Prelosic is a fantastic drug. I was part of really the second wave of people that came in. The first group came out of Merck. Merck had the marketing muscle. Astra had the compound, and they kind of came together. Interesting, the group of folks that left Merck, individuals who wanted to do it differently, break out of the more conventional approaches to building an organization and commercializing the drug. And there were some amazing leaders in that organization who had a kind of a big, bold vision for where this wanted to go, where they wanted to take this. To your point, I was right at the beginning of the, where care in the U.S. was being more carefully managed through managed care organizations. And I was brought in to really think about how to manage the drug access side of it, the patient access side to it. uh, Myself and a couple of other really key individuals in my life, friends that I've had now for 25 years, it was all very new. Everything was new. We were doing everything differently. There were no preconceived notions about where to go and how to get something done. There was a lot of latitude. There was a lot of, hey, if you think it's a great idea, you know, put the case together and let's go. The drug was growing very, very rapidly. So there's a lot of willingness to take risk, risk from trying new ideas, risk from building the organization different, risk in terms of thinking about how we approach the broader physician provider network in the United States. And it really gave me a chance to be more creative. 
when you're sitting inside J and J, larger company, much more prescribed, much more structured. Learn the foundations of healthcare there. But Astra Merck was a incredible journey with some incredible leaders who had this idea that maybe we could do this differently. And that carried through all the way through my career, including the arena where we sort of had a mantra of like, well, how do we do this different? Why do we have to do this the way it's always been done? Challenging convention, thinking creatively, thinking about better ways to help patients access drugs. That foundational piece came from the work at Astra Merck. And I'm incredibly grateful for those few years and, and for the people I worked with there. So what was this new marketing approach, though, that they had written about in the HBS case study? They decentralized the way drugs are sold. So in prior to Astra Merck, it was very much a command and control. You had a large corporate headquarters. They laid out the game plan, and then they just rolled it out to sales organizations. And the sales organization's job was to execute whatever was in front of them. Astromerk decentralized that. And it's even more true now. Astromerk recognized, and the leaders at Astromerk recognized, that the California healthcare market looked very different than the Florida healthcare market, which looked very different than parts of the Midwest. So they had regional leaders who were responsible for their own P&L, almost like in Europe where you'd have a country manager for Germany and a country manager for the Nordics, recognizing that while the product stays the same, the way you approach the market, the way you approach the payer access in each of those environments is very, very different. So in the same vein, it sort of decentralized the approach. And I think that was one of the hallmarks. While the strategy stayed the same, the execution, a lot more flexibility to these regional directors who were able to manage their business. I would argue that business model was probably even 10 years ahead of its time or even 15 years ahead of its time. Because if you look at the U.S. today, it is even more fragmented. How you approach Northern California is different than how you approach Southern California. Massachusetts looks completely different than New Jersey or New York in terms of how you would approach it. Who the payers are, who the providers are, which hospital systems have control or not control in these areas. It's been this rapid progression from the mid-90s to today. I'd say that model is probably even more applicable today than it was back when it was envisioned. So really forward thinking. And my role there was really interesting because manage markets or manage care or patient access had never been any, really been a big issue in the U.S. You had a drug, you talked to the physician, the physician wrote the prescription, the patients got the drug. As more and more drugs entered the market, more expensive drugs, more niche drugs entered the market, and this whole middle layer of managing access to healthcare came to be. And as that group, this intermediary customer that evolved, we as a pharmaceutical industry weren't ready for it. And if you combine that with regional changes that were happening, you can start to see the dislocation of a central command and control type commercial approach. So it was really forward leaning. And I was really given a blank sheet of paper to go off and, and try to figure out exactly how do we help these regional directors, these regional businesses navigate their specific markets. And they were very, very different. Some markets were more advanced in terms of where you could actually consider them looking more like Europe with a central payer system where they have these large integrated delivery networks or IDNs. This is where physicians are employed by the health system. So think about uh, in the U.S. we have in California, we have Kaiser. Kaiser Permanente looks a lot like uh, many healthcare systems in Europe. Physicians are employed by the organization. Well, Kaiser was growing but it was really Northern California at that point, not Southern California. How you managed and navigated Northern California looked different than Southern California. Our job was to help these different field-based organizations think about how to navigate and how to approach them. In Detroit, there's Henry Ford Health System. That was one of the more progressive systems at the time. In Utah, it was Intermountain. And they were just starting out. They were just starting to build these, this new customer that we had never dealt with before. So it was incredibly empowering to, A, have a blank sheet of paper, and two, to learn about where all of this started and where all of it was going. Just a great experience. I think I had a very similar experience coming out of university. I worked in a very, very entrepreneurial environment, and I think it influenced me and the career trajectory that I had later. 
I want to move forward now to your time at Emgen. Before you became the general manager for Emgen's European Nephrology Business Unit, you actually proposed the acquisition of Humanex and what is today a $5 billion drug to treat autoimmune disease. Can you tell us about how you put that deal together that's worth $16 billion acquisition? And just tell us some of the lessons that you learned from that experience. I think one of the prevailing themes in my career has been working with amazing people and working for amazing people. And it was true at Astra Merck, and it was definitely true at Amgen. My boss at the time, Keith Leonard, he and I were charged with building out the immunology business. We had a drug called Kinneret that we were in the process of launching. It was Amgen's first retail drug. All of Amgen's other drugs were sold directly to the physician or hospital environment. It was Amgen's first self-administered drug. All the other drugs were infused. So there were a lot of firsts for this drug, Kinneret, and it was in the autoimmune space to treat a disease called rheumatoid arthritis. So we were charged with putting that business unit together. And I remember day one, it was just Keith and I and a whiteboard trying to figure out how we would put this whole thing together. And as we went, kind of went down and we started building the infrastructure, we realized that infrastructure needed to be leveraged across a second product or third product. Enbro was, was, is a great drug. Because we had already built so much of that substantial infrastructure and Amgen had the wherewithal financially to do a large transaction, we proposed acquiring Immunex. I think we beat that drum for a good 12 months before we were able to get the deal done. But the simple idea was, let's take the infrastructure we've already built, let's leverage it across multiple drugs so we can provide more of a a stepwise basket solution to physicians. If drug one doesn't work, you have access to drug two. And that turned out to be a real winner for Amgen long-term and for patients because we were able to leverage all that infrastructure across multiple drugs. A lot has changed in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis since then, but Enbrel is still a cornerstone product, and I think it still continues to do quite well. Again, the lessons that we learn along the way, to not have fear, to raise your hand when someone wants to build an immunology business unit inside what is ostensibly a cancer company, an oncology company, there was only a couple of us that raised our hands to go start this new business unit. I think have the courage to say, look, our drug is good, but this other drug's even better. Why don't we put the two things together? I think even in a corporate environment, that entrepreneurial spirit can still be there. You can still take risk. You can take on the new project. You can propose the big, bold, audacious idea. We made a lot of mistakes along the way, but we did a lot of great things along the way. But you can never kind of get rid of that spirit once you have it, as as you point out from your experience. And once you have it, then you're always looking for the next idea, the next thing, the next bold idea to go after. Speaking of your next bold idea, by the time you founded your first business venture, you had already spent 15 years in the industry. What led you to found Kythera? It was uh, an interesting time. Amgen had grown quite dramatically. I think when I joined Amgen, it was probably around. 1,500 people globally in the company, maybe 2,000. I went to Europe to run nephrology and we came back. The company had grown quite dramatically. I think it was probably in the 15 to 20,000 people range. If you really want to be creative, if you really want to do fun, exciting things, it gets harder and harder as the companies grow that large. The group that I was involved with, the new products marketing group, for example, had five people in it, six people in it. When I came back from Europe, it had 120 people in it. These groups just continued to grow and, and expand in infrastructure for long-term growth, and I understand that. But I think you always have to ask yourself, am I having fun? Is this a place I want to be? Is this the things I want to do? It would have been just as easy to stay there, and the stock continued to do well, so financially it would have been fine. But it wasn't fun anymore. I needed to find something that energized me again So I decided to just kind of jump off the ledge. So I I left Amgen with really no other job on the horizon. I found a drug at UCLA, Harbor UCLA Medical Center, that I thought was really interesting. Contacted my old boss at Amgen. I said, I think I found something interesting. Can we take a look at it and see if there's a company here? And we, uh, 2005, we founded Kythera. I think it was August of 05. And it was the three of us. We put our own money into the company. We started in one little office in Woodland Hills, California. And one minute we were 
working on licensing the product. And next minute we were plugging in the phones under the desk and I was excited again. It was fun. We were in this little tiny rowboat together. It was an amazing time. And as much as you think you know, coming out of big companies, worked on large business units, did large M&A, you think you know all this stuff. When you jump onto the really small side and you're starting to deal with a venture-backed company, it's a whole nother universe, as you all know. So all of a sudden I was learning again. There was things to learn, things to figure out. And as long as there's stuff to learn and to figure out and it's fun and there's a real purpose behind what you're doing, I find myself incredibly energized. When that starts to dissipate, I always get the sense it's time to go on to something else. So speaking of learning about something and jumping into the next, learning something new, especially at a startup, how did you raise your first round of external financing like Kythera? So the A round, Kythera was actually led by management. So we led the A round. We invited one venture fund to join. It was a relatively small A round. And that was interesting because I remember um, vividly talk about funny stories. I remember sitting at a coffee shop and getting the term sheet on curly fax paper sent to the coffee shop. And we had to physically take a scissor and cut them into pages. So Kythera, you could argue Kythera was formed at a coffee shop on curly fax paper for all your listeners that still remember curly fax paper. I remember my old boss, Keith Leonard, and I sitting there like physically cutting the pages and going through the term sheet. And we had bought a couple of books off of Amazon on how to read a venture capital term sheet and all the different ways the term sheet can stick it to you. Lots of nice legal jargon. And we're back and forth on our flip phones to our, to our, uh, to our attorneys. And it was a great learning experience because literally we had a book and we had little post-its in the book and we're like, what does a ratchet mean? What does a liquidation preference mean? And it was really fun. It was just a blast. So uh, I think that coffee shop is still there. Anybody wants to start a company, I recommend that coffee shop. I think it's either a coffee shop or at a bar. That's how usually companies get started, at least successful ones. <laughs> so that's how you raise your Series A. And during the 2008 financial crisis, it was very difficult to raise venture money. What did you do differently to secure your financing during this time period? We had two road bumps along the way, 2008. And then if you recall, 2010 wasn't very great either. So in 2008, and I think this is where your life experience begins to matter. Having lived and worked all over the world during the great financial crisis in 2008, you know, capital really dried up. High-risk capital definitely dried up. As you know, biotech is all high-risk capital. So we agreed that I would go look for capital outside the United States and spend a lot of time in the Middle East, Malaysia, Singapore, a lot of time in Singapore, Japan. And we eventually got a couple of term sheets, all ex-US and we're fortunate enough to have JAFCO in Japan lead the, lead the round in 2008. It's interesting, for, at least for us at the time, I mean, it took nine trips and five months, six months to really get our head, get our personally, our heads around raising money outside the U.S., but more importantly, for institutional investors outside the U.S. investing in early into biotech. But we're incredibly grateful to JAFCO for believing in the company and believing in us and we provided them a great return, which is fantastic. But they were there in 2008 when there weren't a lot of other folks around. But again, it goes back to that. When you have to get something done, sometimes you have to think differently and you have to kind of break the mold. And instead of banging on doors that aren't going to open, try to find doors that might be slightly open. So I think venture capital is drying up again during this eight, day and age. Are there things that you could think of to help to guide the founders and the entrepreneurs that's listening to this episode today? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One, and again, it goes back to creativity. In this environment, and I'll speak specifically to biotechnology and biopharmaceuticals because it's what I know. During the period of easy money, we formed a lot of companies. I think at one point, 70% of biotech CEOs were first-time CEOs. So we formed a lot of companies. We put a lot of money to work. Most of these companies were single product companies maybe two products. So they lack kind of critical scale. So I think to survive in this environment, you have to think very, very differently. Specifically, think about, had this conversation a whole bunch of times, does your company need to exist as a standalone company? Are you better off putting two or three smaller biotech companies together so you can live to fight another day? And again, the big challenge there becomes egos. And I want to be the CEO or I want to be the CEO. And the reality is, if you take a step back and say, 
it's the enterprise that needs to win and the product needs to get to the patient. If that's your overarching objective, then you can always find a way. Um, if you throw egos in the middle of it, I think that's a, a huge impediment. So at least in the biopharmaceutical sector and perhaps in the tech sector, maybe in some other sectors that are facing a potential capital crunch in this most recent downturn, I had really asked, does your company need to survive as an individual company? Are you better off putting two or three ideas together to get sort of that critical mass leverage? If you have a sub $500 million market cap company in biotech today, and you're publicly traded, of course, you're spending just way too much money just being a public company. And all that general administrative cost structure can be leveraged across three or four products as opposed to a single product. So I think there's a critical scale issue, but it takes a lot of courage and it takes awareness. Awareness. That's a great word. Yeah. It takes that awareness to be able to say, hey, I don't have to be CEO, but I really want my product to succeed. So here's the right idea. And I think you're spot on. I think awareness is the right word. So six years after you founded Kythera, you left to join Presivia, which was a joint venture between two Dutch companies, Royal, DS Royal DSM and Crisel. Was it difficult for you to leave Kythera, the company that you had founded six, six years earlier? Yeah, very much. I'd been on a leadership team, been the number two person in a company, run some business units, et cetera, but I'd never had a chance to run something of my own. And I got the opportunity to be a CEO, my first job. And I called it my CEO with training wheels because it was a private company. We had two large shareholders. And really importantly, the chairman of the company was Jim Mullen, who's a, a bit of a legend in our industry, was the chairman and CEO of Biogen for many, many years. Wonderful human being and a great mentor. And I thought, well, if I'm ever going to take the leap, this is the step I'd want to take. And it required moving to Boston. And that was wonderful. I had a great time in Boston. But having these kind of key elements and saying this is a good starting place was really important. And then, of course, uh, J&J acquired the assets of that company, acquired the company really for their vaccine platform, which was really fascinating to me. We got a call that they were interested in the technology. And I remember thinking back, this is 2011, 2012. I remember thinking to myself, there's no money in vaccines. Why would anyone want to be in vaccines? So just a Talking about things you can't see around the corner. So it was a good outcome for the shareholders, good outcome for the employees, and of course, eventually a great outcome for humanity as J&J did make the vaccine in the cell platform that we sold them. So that's touching a little bit of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just so that you know, that comment that you made about vaccines, our mutual friend made the same comment to me three years ago when I asked him whether or not I should invest in Moderna. And he's like, no, there's no money in vaccines. So if he's listening, he knows. <laughs> I'm never following his advice. I'm never following his advice again. Kythera was eventually sold to Allergan for $2.1 So a few years after that you had left, did you ever feel like that you missed out on taking the company all the way? Not particularly. Look, it was in great hands. The team that came in after me did a phenomenal job. And I think... As the Brits like to say, I think you have to always remember horses for courses. There's some folks that are the right people at the right time in a company, and then there's other people that can build it out. Kythera was heading toward launch, commercial launch, and my heart really wasn't in that. We had done a large deal with Bayer for XUS rights. We'd raised plenty of capital. The company was in great shape. It was time for the next group of leaders to take it to the next level, which they did. So I made the same comment to every board I've been on, every CEO job I've had, that at some point I'm not the right CEO and I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, you need a different skill set. So I think in building and scaling a company, there's a certain type of individual that you need, a certain team that you need. As you move to more of a steady state product launch mode, there's a kind of a different mindset, different skill set, different group of people who can take that to the next level. So I think there's a natural evolution to companies I'm sure you've seen this even more than I have, where founder CEOs stay too long in their roles. So I think it's really important to understand what that transition looks like. And when you use your word, awareness, it's really important to have that awareness as someone leading an organization. So after Crisell was acquired by Johnson Johnson, then led the turnaround at Ipris Biopharmaceuticals, which was a company that was backed by TPG, a private equity, a big private equity firm. At the time, it looked like a good story with the right approach, but it filed for bankruptcy four years later. What do you think happened with the story of Ipirus? 
Yeah, we had an interesting journey there. We took over the company and within three months, we found that the founders had that committed essentially fraud, about $20 million worth of fraud. We had a lot of cleanup to do. We stripped the company down to three people. And nine months later, we took the company public. We had an interesting business model, which now in hindsight, I can critique my own business model. The company was focused on biosimilars, which are generic versions of biologic drugs. Biologic drugs are notoriously difficult to make. And the pathways to get those generic versions of biotechnology drugs, biologic drugs, to the market was far more robust outside the United States and inside the United States. And even today, these biosimilars have done better outside the U.S. than in the U.S. And so our business model was really focused outside the United States. It was a very interesting and I'd say ahead of its time business model where we were going to transfer manufacturing to local countries. So as an example, we had won a tender in Brazil and we were going to do a tech transfer to help Brazil make their own biotech drugs in Brazil. We call that in-market for market. And interestingly, speaking of Moderna, they recently teamed up with the same company we had teamed up with to transfer vaccine manufacturing in market for market. So here we are, you know, how many ever years later, and, and that model still seems to perpetuate. The challenge that we didn't fully recognize is how to convince U.S. investors to support a model like that. And it's very hard for a U.S. investor to diligence a tender in Brazil or diligence a collaboration with the Saudi government to help build biomanufacturing in Saudi Arabia. And back then, there weren't the large pockets of money in the Middle East that were being deployed to biotech. So if I had to step back and say, what could we have done differently? I would have said we should have spent much more time thinking about non-U.S. sources of capital. Frankly, probably shouldn't have gone public. Because once we went public, we were beholden to the U.S. capital markets, and we were talking to the usual players, and we didn't fit their pattern recognition. So eventually, we had a European player who acquired the assets of the company and is still making biosimilar drugs in, in Europe using the technologies. We sold them to our research and development platform in the Netherlands. So even that less than happy outcome has a very happy ending, which is some of those products are, have come to market or are actually coming to market. And at the end of the day, that's why we do what we do is to make sure these drugs can get to market. So I think I would have probably stayed private longer and I would have looked for non-conventional sources of capital. You have gone to Malaysia. Yeah, we went to Malaysia. We worked with MTTC in Malaysia and NTech in Kuwait. And with this idea of everyone kind of liked the idea, but there was no receptor on the other side, right? So you walked into these markets and you said, you talked to government officials and deputy health ministers. And you said, we'd like to help you set up your own biomanufacturing capabilities so you can make your own biotech drugs. Great idea. But they didn't have the management on that side. So sort of a second key learning, right? So you can't force something on. And even if it's a great idea, if there's not a good receptor on the other side, it becomes very, very difficult. So lots of great lessons learned through that journey. And it's really a matching the right capital to the right story. And not every story has the same kind of capital requirements. And not every story is going to resonate with a call conventional U.S. biotech investors. So I think that's the lessons learned from that. Plus, one of your major investors is a private equity firm, so it couldn't have been very easy to do, having a PE firm on your board. <laughs> yeah, and interestingly, they had close to 100% turnover in their healthcare fund right at the same time. So there was a moment in which we literally had nobody at TPG that we could talk to because everyone had left or was leaving. So um, that turnover didn't particularly help as well. But I never want to point the fingers at situations and circumstances, I always want to take away lessons learned. And the lesson learned here was I needed to be more bold in thinking through the capital structure and thinking through how we built the company. And I, uh, it was one of the biggest lessons I took from Epirus to Arena, which is you can't incremental your way through a turnaround situation. It takes big, bold thinking. You got to take a razor blade, sometimes a hatchet. <laughs> to the whole idea and rethink it from the ground up. And I don't think we did enough of that at Epirus. But nonetheless, it was your first and probably only bankruptcy that you had to deal with. Do you recall how you felt at the time? Because you were there for four years, right? I absolutely depressed. And I knew the technologies because we did the asset sale. We knew that the assets would get to market. And we knew that our, the European buyer would do a great job with the, 
with the infrastructure we sold them, the R&D organization. But I really felt bad for the people. And that's what gave me the sleepless nights, right? When you go into biotech, the employees of a biotech company, the leadership of a biotech company, we don't have a portfolio effect. We're not investors. We're not in 40, 50 companies. You're, you're really throwing your body in front of the train in a very high-risk endeavor. So I always feel my number one obligation is to the team and the people, and letting them down was the hard part. Now we're going to shift to the turnaround of Arena, as you mentioned earlier, which you took, which from Ipris, you took a lot of great lessons coming out of that. Back in 2016, I'm told that Arena was a mess and it was everyone's favorite stock to short. So coming from a company that you had just put into bankruptcy, why did you take the job? I always have a fundamental tenet in our business, which is you can fix anything. You can't fix bad drugs. And Arena had a very long history on the research side. It had actually taken quite a few products all the way through phase one clinical development. So in in our world, we have phase one, which is early healthy volunteer type clinical development. Phase two is your proof of concept in patients. And phase three is your confirmatory trial, which you would eventually register with the FDA. And they'd taken up, I think it was up to about nine products through phase one and then put them on a shelf. They were focused on an obesity compound at the time, a drug called Belvic. Belvic had gotten approved but it failed commercially. They had a large partnership with ASI, the Japanese company, and they were unable to commercialize it successfully. So the company had kind of fallen apart. The board had been together for 20 something years. The management team that was left was largely decimated and folks had sort of lost belief. And the fundamental idea is we believe the products were good. And when you have eight or nine products to work with, the simple ideas of the first three we picked, if one of them showed a strong clinical signal, it was a 3x return for investors. And it was our job to just get that across. Something almost magical happened. Of the first three drugs and five indications we tried, we won four out of five times. So the fundamental premise that the products were good was the overarching belief going in and proved itself to be true. But the lessons learned out of Presivia were absolutely germane to the turnaround arena. I remember telling the chairperson at the time, Tina Nova, that I wasn't going to do anything incremental. If we were going to turn the company around, we really needed to turn the company around. And we had to turn around the management team. So we reset the entire, 100% of the management team was new. We reset the entire board of directors over the first year, with the exception of Tina. And we went down a journey of resetting all expectations for the company. So when I... um, when I took over in May of 16, we were about 95% retail shareholders. So all the, the big institutions had fled the stock or, or to your point, had a, a short on the stock. But we began to really build a compelling story. We began to bring some key people across, began to rebuild the credibility of the company in the marketplace. And then, of course, when the first data read out, we had a tremendous amount of interest. When the second data read out, we had even more interest and, and then just went from there. But I think, again, I always like to come back to what did I learn? How did I implement it? This idea of being able to do things incrementally in a turnaround situation, I think you literally have to start with a blank sheet of paper all over again and redesign the company. So like you said, you didn't want to do anything incrementally, but you basically turned the company upside down, inside out. You gutted it within the first six months, I think. What were your top priorities for the turnaround when you first joined? The first thing we needed was a new team. If I'm the smartest guy in the room, the company is doomed. So we needed to rebuild the team and in the same vein, rebuild the board of directors. Investors weren't going to have a confidence in the company unless we had a new board of directors. The board had been together a long time. They were in their, several of them were in their mid to late 70s and sort of lacked contemporary biopharma knowledge. In fact, I'd argue there was nobody on the board when I took over, I had drug development experience. Lots of really smart people from different walks of life and different industries, but we were a drug development company. So you sort of need that key core expertise around the board. So we went forward to change the board around, brought in a whole new management team. A lot of the management team came from Amgen, folks I'd worked with at Amgen. So our chief commercial officer, our chief medical officer, just our CFO eventually. We were all together at Amgen and we'd all work together in different capacities. So we brought a team that had been there, done that, scaled an organization, scaled an enterprise. And that was a huge success factor. 
to making it all happen. But that was priority number one. Again, like I said, you can't do this by yourself, right? You got to have an organization and team and an environment and rebuild the culture of the company. All of that had to get redone. But it, it was really hard. We laid off close to 300 people in the first two weeks and stripped the company down to about 35 people. So those are things I don't want to do again. I was going to ask you about that firing process, what it was like for you. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It's either that or the company doesn't survive. It's radical surgery. And back to my point about you can't incremental your way out of these situations. That's just what needed to be done. We needed critical skills to keep the lights on as a public company. And we need to rebuild the management team. And we didn't need 250 researchers. Like there just wasn't room for that. So that was presumably the lowest point for Arena, I think, because it had a terrible reputation and you even had trouble recruiting some new blood. So given such a tough beginning, how were you able to then rebuild Arena? It started with the team and again, started by bringing in some really great talent. Uh, Our CFO, Kevin Lin, who now runs Longboard Pharmaceuticals, was critical in those early days. Really savvy capital market CFO. Ironically, came from TPG, and he was instrumental in helping us on the capital side of it. We brought in Dr. Preston Clausen, who he and I worked together at Amgen. Preston's a nephrologist by training and just a brilliant drug developer. He brought with him a, a whole team, and we began to kind of build it by brick. And we had to execute on the clinical trials. We had to finish the clinical trials, and we barely had enough money to get there. And that was literally the first three to four months was just convincing people that this was worth doing and sharing the story of the compound, where they came from. The arena scientists, historically, 25 years, had one of the best chemistry groups in a specific class of drugs that existed anywhere on the planet. And then they lost their way a little bit. But the underlying chemistry was fantastic. And we had strong conviction the drugs were going to work. And it was a matter for us to be able to execute. And eventually you guys raised about $900 million in financing. How was the fundraising process for Arena by that time? Painful. So we were averaging somewhere through the six-year journey, the whole six-year journey. We never took our foot off gas. We were averaging somewhere between 715 and 1,000 investor meetings a year. And any opportunity we got to be in front of investors and tell the story and then retell the story and then tell the story again. Like any sales process, it's competitive, right? You're competing for limited dollars across 500,000 public biotech companies. So you've got to have that ability to deal with rejection, the ability to keep telling the story. And we're back to being a commission-only sales organization. (laughs) There you go. That helps. (laughs) It all comes back full circle. So we built a compelling story and we got a few early investors to bite. Then once we had our first clinical data readout that was an absolute success, then we had some momentum on our sides. But independent of that, every board I'm on, I always remind public company CEOs that it's a competitive environment. And are you ready to tell your story 500, 750 times a year to the same people over and over? Answer questions from all different angles, uh, handle objections. And back to my very early comment about sales and how important that is, these are the fundamentals, right? Are you willing to pull a compelling story together? Are you willing to tell that story over and over? Are you willing to take rejection? I think it's, look, some companies are in the right place at the right time, Moderna. But I'm sure if you ask the Moderna management team what it was like pre-COVID, they were at all the same conferences I was at, and they were telling the same stories over and over. And they told it with conviction. They believed, and they did an amazing job. So if you build a great story and you truly believe you have conviction, you have the courage to, to think about something, to tell a bigger idea, a bigger story, then it's just hard work. So you talked about building the management team, building up the new board of the company. As you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you play basketball. So in what way was it similar to build a team in basketball in the case of Arena? Oh boy. If you think about any sports and you think about whether it's football, American football, basketball, if you take five individuals who know how to play the game, and you put them on a court together, within about five or six minutes, they'll figure each other out. They'll figure out where they need to be on the court, who's doing what, how to play together as a team. Interesting, if you throw just one new person on the court who's never played the game, guarantee that person will be out of place. 
they'll be in the wrong place at the wrong time. They won't know what to do in certain situations. So it's that pattern recognition that you build with 20, 30 years in the industry. So building a team that's got that A team mindset, but a group of pros that knows exactly where to be when they need to be there is really, really key. And I think that's true for really any sports and I think any leadership team. I've had experiences where you had one person who probably was not ready for that role and it really creates issues. They don't understand when to stay in their lane and then when to be part of a team, which hat you're wearing at what time. And it creates a lot of, I'll call it just friction in an organization. So in a very similar vein, I think we were able to pull a team of professionals together. And, and importantly, about halfway through the arena journey, we turned that whole team over. Because the team that got you from 300 million market cap to a billion market cap was probably not the team that gets you from a billion to $10 billion. Different skill set, different growth. In the early days, you needed strong leaders who were running smaller organizations, but they also were great individual contributors. As you grew the company, you needed people who could scale. And as I mentioned very early on conversation today, I said there was a point at which I told the board that I'm not going to be the right CEO, right? And so I think you've got to constantly be asking yourself, do you have the right team at the right time in a company's journey? And not everybody fits that, that right time commandment. So I think that was another really hard piece is to you have loyalty to the people who got you here, but you know they can't get you to the next stage. And that's a really difficult, very difficult conversation to have. I can imagine. I can very much imagine. One of the things that you did at the beginning of Arena was getting rid of this weight loss drug that it had already been commercialized. Why did you pull this revenue generating drug? It seemed like quite a departure from someone that had a sales and marketing background. Yeah, we had a collaboration with ASI. ASI was doing the commercialization. We collected a royalty on it. The drug was doing $40, $50 million a year in revenue, which is not really substantial by the time we pay for cost of goods and we got our check, we were getting six, $7 million a year. The previous management team had built a ton of infrastructure around that drug. We had to make the drug, to package the drug. We had a 100,000 square foot facility in Zofingen, Switzerland. We had 100 people sitting there in Switzerland to essentially make a drug that was doing 50 million in a year. We had seven metric tons of drug supply sitting on the shelf, enough for 100 years of sales. So we needed to find a way to reduce our exposure. But I think even more important than all of that was focus. I could not have a company focused on two different things. We couldn't be a drug development company and be focused on this one little asset out here. Not when you only have 30 people in the company and three or four quarters of cash. You needed to get that laser focus in terms of what you wanted to be as a business long term. And the market had spoken. It wasn't the drug wasn't going to magically go 10x in revenue, right? The drug had already been on the market for two years. Physicians had spoken, patients had spoken, not much of an opportunity. And ASI, to their credit, they agreed to take the product in its entirety and take the liabilities and take all of that. They felt the commitment to the drug that they were also very, very involved with in the development. So we were able to reach an agreement and it allowed us to focus and reset the story. Internal focus and external story needed to match. So if, if externally people still saw we had the old Belvic asset, it was didn't allow us to tell a compelling story around the new arena. And then internally, that would have just been a drag on both financial drag as well as focus drag. And going back to my kind of lessons learned, we couldn't incremental our way out of that. You also ended up signing an 800 million licensing deal from a partnership with United Therapeutics so that you could build up the balance sheet. Can you tell us a little bit about that licensing deal with United Therapeutics and how you guys put that together? Yeah, amazing company, amazing story. They're focused on PAH or pulmonary arterial hypertension, a very specific disease. They've got several drugs in that category. And our first drug was for PAH. So we got positive phase two data on that drug, and we began building our own infrastructure to go run the next study, the phase three study. While we were doing that, our second drug read out. Our second drug was a drug called atrazomod for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and a whole host of autoimmune diseases. 
And when the second drug read out, we were still only about 70 people in the company. By that point, we'd raised $600, $700 million in equity capital. So while we had the financial means to run both programs, we couldn't scale up the company fast enough. And I think the difference between the two drugs is that the first drug, which was called Relinapeg or PAH, that drug was a single indication drug. It was really designed for that one disease. Etrazumab, our second drug, had broad utility, probably over time, probably eight or 10 different diseases. So we had to place a bet which one we were going to go focus on. And with United Therapeutics being so heavily focused in the PAH space, uh, naturally they expressed interest. And we got together and put the deal together. The drug had fantastic data, almost 2x the clinical benefit of J&J's competing drug with a once a day oral. And most of the drugs in the category are infusions or inhaled. So to be able to do this with a once a day oral was quite spectacular. So we were very pleased with the clinical data. We could have built an entire company on it. And that was our intent until the second drug read out. And then the real issue became one of critical scale. So we were, like I said, we were 70, 75 people. We would have had to hire 200 people in three months in order to scale up the company to execute both things. And we just simply couldn't do it. So rather than do two things poorly, we chose to do one thing well, which was to really develop a trazomide. But we developed a trazomide in five indications, five different diseases. So it had this kind of blood clinical utility. Behind a trazomide, we had another drug in pain. We had another two drugs in cardiovascular medicine. And we had three drugs in the neuroscience space. So it wasn't that we were worried that we wouldn't have more things to work on. We had a really deep pipeline. So we firmly believed United Therapeutics could do a better job developing and eventually commercializing this drug than we could. So putting it in their hands was not only in the best interest of our balance sheet, but really in the best interest of patients. I'm told that you made all the right decisions in turning around Arena. So besides that one decision that you made, which is licensing the first drug to United Therapeutic and actually keeping the second drug, was the smartest decision that you made? Why could I have a laundry list of mistakes I made? We can go through those. <laughs> For every one great decision, there's always a handful of things you look back and say, God, I wish I'd done that differently. I think one of the things that we did, I'm going to come back to management team. I had a very supportive board. I mean, they, they tested me. They pushed me. It was always a contentious, not in a bad way, but there was always vigorous debate at the board level. But when I needed to make the hard decisions, they were always there to support me. So when I kind of midway through the journey, we said, look, we got to make some changes on the management team. We needed a new general counsel. We needed a new CFO. We needed an R&D leader who could scale to that next level. They were very, very supportive. I'd say getting the right board dynamics and getting diverse opinions around the board, different vantage points, different thought processes, different experiences to be able to really really pressure test these difficult moments when you have to make changes and, and navigate complex things or license out a drug it is probably one of the best things I did was making those changes at the board level. It cascades down, right? It, it allows you to make the more difficult decisions as a manager, makes, allows you to think through, look, divesting a drug for $800 million up front, while it sounds great in hindsight, it was a very difficult decision at the time. Because most biotech companies would love to have one drug with that kind of data that we had, right? We ended up with a couple of them. So it was very difficult to let go of your, send your first child off to boarding school. But having a board that can wrestle with that decision with you is really, really important. You know, as I think about whatever I choose to do in the future and the boards I'm on, I'm always trying to ask, do we have the right dynamics? Are we wrestling through the right decisions? Are we having the detailed conversations? Because I think that makes companies better. I'm actually told that you ran smarter trials. I believe the second drug that you spoke of, I can't pronounce the name. Entrazumab. Okay, Entrazumab. In that second drug, you, it was actually a Me Too drug. It was the second drug on the market. Is that correct? It was the third. It was the third. Okay, but I'm told that you ran smarter trials. <laughs> and it wasn't me. We had a great team and my challenge to the team is, how can we do this differently? How can we do this better? How can we do this faster? We experienced exactly zero delays during COVID. 
We had 400 plus clinical sites in 40 countries. Other biotech companies were shutting trials down entirely. We never did. And because of how we structured the trials, how we structured the clinical sites, we did things like build our own internal infrastructure. So most biotech companies rely heavily on contract research organizations, CROs. Contract research organizations really run your clinical trials. You design them, but they really execute the trials on the ground. And these are massive organizations and it allows small companies to do large trials. We took a slight different tact. We said they can run the operational details, but we want to own the relationship with the physician. So we had our own infrastructure on the ground. In fact, we had 21 medical science liaisons or MSLs educating physicians on our drug in US, Europe, and Asia. So as we expanded the trial globally, we had the actual relationship with the physician, the clinician, the clinical trial site, which most biotech companies don't have. So I think that's number one. The second thing we did was we had about 100 employees in Zug, Switzerland, of our 600 or so people inside the company. That group spoke 22 languages. So when there was a problem in Slovenia, usually the study coordinators at the clinical sites are not likely to speak a lot of English. So we had someone who could communicate. So we're super responsive to the clinical sites. And that, through COVID, allowed us to really rapidly adjust which sites were open, which sites were closed. We had the relationships at the sites. We were able to speak the local language. And we weren't relying on the CRO to make all that stuff happen. So not only were our clinical trial designs, I think, pretty elegant and well thought through, but the execution on the ground, I think, made all the difference. And I think we executed differently than most biotech companies could execute. And partly, Jennifer, because we had the balance sheet to do it. So most biotech companies can't just randomly hire another 150 people to, to run global clinical trials. But we could and we did. By the way, speaking of the biotech industry, I'm told that the industry is similar to speculative oil drilling for PhDs. You can probably imagine which of our, our friend made that comment. <laughs> is that something that you would agree with, Amit? Absolutely. Our risk model looks like oil and natural gas, for sure. In fact, ironically, when I was at Amgen, we had a decision analytics group, really smart modeling individuals. They all, literally the entire group came from Exxon. And they literally brought that, all that thinking directly into biotech. Because it's the same idea. You spend a decade working on a project, and eventually it'll be profitable or not profitable. Eventually it'll work. Just so many binary risk milestones along the way. It looks a lot like it. And I learned a lot from the group at Amgen that came from Exxon because when they started modeling out oil and natural gas, I'm like, oh, it's just exactly the same thing. It's hard. I believe biotech is the fourth or fifth most regulated industry in the world. I think we're above the U.S. waterways, as an example. So developing a drug is not for the faint of heart. From the moment a product goes into the first animal to all the way when the product is priced in the market, even the trade name of the product and Advertising, everything is regulated. Every step of the way for that decade or 15 years is regulated. If running clinical trials in biotech or just the biotech industry, it's really expensive. It costs about, I think, about a billion dollars just to bring a drug to market, right? And some people say that the system is, has been very efficient for making money, but it's broken and we need to have better business models for the industry. Is that also how you see the industry going? Would you agree with that statement? I would have to zoom out a little bit and say, and I'm going to speak specifically to the U.S. because the, the way drugs are delivered and the way drugs are paid for is very, very different market to market. My personal perspective in the U.S. is our delivery is broken. Roughly 40 cents of every dollar for a cost of a drug is eaten up by middlemen who contribute nothing to R&D. And I often say, like, I could probably take 30, 40 cents out of the dollar on the drug costs out of the system overnight, which is a bit of an exaggeration. But the idea is that in Europe, you don't have these huge middlemen infrastructure. You don't have a rebating system in the middle. You don't have all these different layers of managed care organizations and PBMs and all this tons of three-letter acronym middlemen in, in between the time a drug leaves our warehouse and eventually gets to the patient at the pharmacy. There's probably four layers in between there. And those four layers eat up 40 cents on the dollar. So when you have this inefficient system in terms of delivering, 
medicines, I mean, you have to look at that because that contributes nothing to research and development. It contributes nothing to innovation or to patient care. And I think that's the first place to look in terms of cost savings, if that's what we're talking about. In terms of developing a drug, I'm not sure there's a lot of shortcuts. I really don't. I, lately, we've been hearing so much about, well, we should just not do animal testing. And the reality is the regulators, so the politicians can say that, but the regulators still demand animal testing. So there's nothing you can really do, right? And many drugs have to go through non-human primate studies, and that's mandatory. You don't have a choice. And those things all add up in terms of massive amounts of costs. Okay. Now, I want to go backward a little bit and talk about how you got Pfizer to be interested in ARENA. How long did this take? How did the deal come about? Tell us about the journey. Yeah, I used to say this at ARENA all the time, which is you don't build a company to sell. You build a company, period. And when you try to build a company to sell, you take shortcuts, you worry about dilution. You try to raise a little less money because it's more dilutive to your shareholders. We had full commercial infrastructure ready to go in the U.S. and Europe. We had a whole commercial team. We had started working on brand names. We were doing everything we needed to do to get ready to sell the drugs ourselves. And because we had the mindset that we were going it alone, there were no shortcuts. There was no shortcuts in the manufacturing. There were no shortcuts. We had backup manufacturing, redundant manufacturing, multiple continents. We had built up drug supply. We had really taken pains to spend the money and the time and the attention that it would take if we were actually building a company. And our objective was to build a company. So it was actually a bit of a surprise when Pfizer called and said they were interested in acquiring the company before our phase three data. That was the big surprise. And what we wrestled with as a board is now the right time. And again, this is the advantage of having a seasoned board of directors. Very quickly, and this is before Russia, Ukraine, this is before all the macroeconomic risks that we've seen, before hiked up inflation and interest rates and SVB and credit suites, before all of this stuff, I recall one of our board members said, I'm starting to see a lot of macro risks ahead. We said, we head into a recession in the next couple of years. We've had 10, 12 years of a fantastic market. It's going to cycle and we're going to see some risks ahead. Now, we couldn't see what those risks were, but the advantage of having pattern recognition around the board of directors. And so we decided to transact with Pfizer. And I think it was the right call at the right time. I think if we would have, we could have continued driving the business. We could have continued doing what we needed to do. But of course, the capital markets today don't look anything like the capital markets in 2020 and 2019, right? So I think we made the right decision, and I think it was driven by an experienced board of directors. The journey was interesting. They had more people in the data room than we had people in the company. So I think we counted close to 800 people touched the data room, and we had about 600 people in the company. And of course, of the 600 people in the company, only 20 or 30 were over the wall in terms of the transaction. So it was a lot to manage. Again, kudos to my team. We'd made the change at general counsel. Our general counsel, extremely experienced. She'd been through a whole bunch of transactions before. Her number two, or the associate general counsel, had been through a whole bunch of transactions before. So they had great pattern recognition. Our head of human resources, so many issues in, in these transactions are HR driven, really people driven. And our head of HR had gone through five transactions, large-scale transactions over time. And it just took a lot of pressure off of us in terms of pattern recognition. They knew what the right governance steps were. It allowed us to focus on the bigger issues in terms of the transactions, which was great. But everything happened really fast. I, I think I don't have the 14 filings here in front of me, but if I recall correctly, I think we first heard from them in October and we announced the deal in December. So it was six weeks of a tremendous amount of work. But it happened very, very fast. And now that you had a year to, re to reflect since the Pfizer acquisition, what do you think of the success and the failures along the way? Or how do you think of success and failure along the way? Like I said, we made a lot of good decisions. We didn't get everything right. And I would say, whatever I work on next, I won't make those same mistakes again. I'll make different mistakes, <laughs> but I won't make the same mistakes. You learn from every journey. I've shared a lot of the things that I thought were really important around the team, the transition of the team, building global infrastructure, paying tremendous attention to the investor base and being front and center with the investors all the time. Those are all things we got right. 
There were a couple of hiccups we had on some of the smaller clinical trials. I think I would have done them a little bit differently. We spun out our neuro. We had three drugs in the neuroscience space, and we spun them off into a new company. And our first CEO went off to run that. There's still a little part of Arena still out there. It's called Longboard Pharmaceuticals. And they're developing our neuroscience drugs. I think if I could have done something differently, I would have accelerated our cardiovascular products. I think there's still tremendous promise. So much emphasis on cancer, but heart disease still kills more people around the world. And we had a couple of fantastic products there. They're now in the hands of Pfizer, and I really hope they develop those products. I wish I'd accelerated those a little bit more, maybe consider a spin-off of those assets. I think in hindsight, we had our hands full and we weren't as focused on that. But I think we could have done something better there to bring long-term patient benefit. So I think there are a couple of things like that that I think back and I think would have been really, really important. The one thing we got really right early on and through the journey was managing our human capital. It's probably the thing I'm the most proud about, not just from a diversity perspective. Our company was 62% female, just as an example. Our board was 44% female. And I didn't even know those numbers, especially the staff, until we sold the company. And my HR guy goes, did you know we were 62% female? I had no idea. And we did just a great job of building a young, not just age-wise, but young in sort of mindset and spirit. I think we built a great culture inside the company. And I think if you talk to 100 random employees who were at Arena and ask them what they miss, I bet you they'd say, just miss the feeling of the company. And I miss it too. I really, really do. But we just had great people. And I think we did probably a better job on human capital than almost anything else. And I think that was a huge part of our success. Huge part. And, you know, look, if I ever choose to jump in an operating role again, I'll take those lessons with me and try to rebuild something that uh, has that same feel. And I know feel is not a quantitative, quantitative analytic. You can't make a slide on feel. But I think how a company feels is really important. And I think it translates into execution. I really do. Well, I think the culture, right? I guess the feel in that sense translate into the culture of a company, which I think is really important because at the end of the day, who builds the products, right? Who runs the company? Who builds the product? And it's the people. And I think the success of a company is very much tied to the culture of the company, which is built by its people, really, at the end of the day. So I think people and culture are two very important elements. And it's also the reason why people stay at certain companies. Yeah, that's the thing I'm the most proud about. I'm proud we built a great company. I'm incredibly proud of the people. And the last day was really difficult. It was really, really difficult because we wanted to go long. We wanted to go build a business. We were going to run this for the next 10 years and launch these drugs. And that part was really tough for folks, including me. So now as the rock star CEO in the biotech industry, what are you going to do next? I'm on a couple of boards trying to help out companies in this really, as you pointed out, really, really tough environment. Got a couple of companies that are public. Most recently, as of last week, Zura Bio, Z-U-R-A. We took that company public via a uh, blank check entity or a SPAC, which was not ideal, but in this environment, we have to navigate and do things a little bit differently. And that company's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to work on. I've got a great young CEO in that role. I've got some former arena folks around the table as well. So I think that's going to be really fun to work on. And then I've got the other boards that you mentioned. So just working with these CEOs, working with these boards, trying to help out. There may be a point in which you take a new operating role and it'll all kind of depend on where these boards all go over time. But I'm still having fun. My days are still busy. I get to interact with amazing people and work on amazing projects. Now, I always tell people who are not in biotech that the reason I love what we do is because long after we're on this planet, these drugs will still be here. And in fact, the drugs will likely be generic and even more millions of people will have access to these drugs. And I think that's just a wonderful way to leave a legacy. What better legacy than helping the human condition? So I'm really proud of what we do as an industry. We don't always get everything right, but by and large, the impact on human health is dramatic and substantial. And I want to be a part of that for as long as I am on this planet. So you might go to bat again, taking another operating role. It's possible. I actually think I'm an okay board member, but I really think I'd really like to run something again when the right opportunity comes up. By the way, where does your love for cowboy boots come from, Amit? Well, first and foremost, it comes from my bad knees and ankles because they're actually the most comfortable thing you can wear. 
So basketball gave me bad knees and ankles. So, but it didn't start there. I really like country music since I was in high school. So that's kind of stayed with me all the way along. Just uh, there's a depth and soul to a lot of country music and I really enjoy it. And the boots help my knees. So I think it's a double benefit. I think I'm up to, you didn't ask me the important question, how many pairs do I have? So how many pairs of cowboy boots do you have? <laughs> do you own? I think I have about 12 pairs. That's not too bad. You're also the master of inspirational quotes. I'm told that your board presentations at Arena were full of them. And you had this quote on your desk from the Reagan Library. Can you tell us what it is and why you have it on your desk? Yeah, I think I was at Persivia when I, uh, I took my youngest daughter to the Reagan Library and had them at the gift shop. It can be done. That's all the quote is. It can be done. And biotech's really difficult. You're always dealing with some kind of challenge in the drug development process. And it was just a reminder that anything's possible and you can make it happen. And I think the three things I used to tell the arena team is we're bound by our creativity in how we run our trials, how we build our organization. We're bound by our courage to make the big, bold decisions like licensing Relina Peg D9 Therapeutics and our conviction to make it happen. And I think those three things define the kind of organizations I like to be involved with. You have the audacity to really press hard and really believe that it can be done. So uh, unfortunately for my team, they all got one of these little plaques on their desk, whether they liked it or not. But it's just a reminder in tough times because we're so subject to market cycles and we're so subject to this binary risk model in biotech where the drugs are going to work or not going to work. So it's a constant reminder that we can navigate it. We can navigate the tough times. We're coming now towards the end. Where can people find you online? I'm on LinkedIn. So I think that's my only social media presence. So I'm on LinkedIn and welcome any comments, quotes, any more inspirational quotes, I'll take them. Any recommendations for cowboy boots, I'm always listening. And I think it's a wonderful industry. And the more people I can help educate on how, what the journey looks like, I would love that. And maybe your next business venture. And maybe my next business venture. Absolutely. If you had to choose, would it be a turnaround or would it be a complete startup from scratch? I'd love to do something earlier, build it from the ground up. Turnarounds are difficult. There's a lot of pain along the way. Like I said, one of the few things I never want to do is have to lay off people again. It's a very emotionally painful process. It's a much more difficult journey. So I, I if I got the opportunity to run something from the ground up and build it and bring the right people together, I think it'd be a lot more fun. I think some people have PTSD from it, from firing people, laying off people. It's horrible. I mean, these are moms and dads and they have mortgages and that's all that weighs on your mind. It's really, really difficult. I don't have that experience. I think I had to lay off one person ever in my life and I actually talked her into quitting. So we talked for an hour. And I told her that it was in her best interest to leave the company. And then the next day she handed me her resignation. <laughs> there you go. I never had to fire anyone. So I don't have to feel bad about it. <laughs> it's always preceded by sleepless nights and followed by a bottle of wine. So it's a tough. Okay. So my last question, what does the founder spirit mean to you, Amit? I think, I know you interview and I've listened to your other podcasts. It's beyond just building a company. There's so many different ways to have the founder spirit. I'd like to think I had this founder spirit when I was inside of Astro Merck or inside of Amgen, right? That idea that you can take any situation and make it a blank sheet of paper and put your own stamp on what you want to build. To have the courage and the belief that you can make something happen in the not-for-profit sector, in the NGO sector, in biotech, in tech, wh whatever it is. Um, but I think it comes down to purpose. I'd be hard-pressed to find a founder that didn't believe they had a real sense of purpose. And I think even inside the larger company I was with, the people bifurcated. There was a group of people who really felt a sense of purpose and a group of people who really had a sense of paycheck. And I think they're two completely different individuals. So I, if I was to give you one word, I'd say it was purpose. We're now coming to the end of our interview. And as you know, we end every episode with a quote. And for this episode, we have a quote from Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa. It always seems impossible until it's done. So Amit, I want to thank you for joining us today and taking us on your magical journey through life. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun.